Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of, you know, some you've never heard of. You know, Jonathan, I like hearing about some of the low point, like challenging stories. So I had, you know, P90X founder, Tony Horton, talked to him. You know, he's obviously made hundreds of millions of dollars, sold hundreds of millions of dollars with P90X, but he talks about, he was a street mime. He made money with, for his food and rent money um, by putting his hat on the street and doing street mime, like street performing, actually. Um, and uh, Baby Einstein founder, Julie Clark, she grew her company $20 million with five employees, ended up selling to Disney, but she beat cancer twice in some of the crazy kind of low points and, and challenges she had. Uh, Atari founder, Nolan Bushnell, um, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, and Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000, and why he said no. And um, there's many more amazing stories on inspiredinsider.com. So check them out. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And you know, Rise25, I was telling Jonathan about this. He's like, what do you actually do? Uh, well, we help uh, B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners and help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. You know, um, it's been the best thing I've done for my business and my life. I've gone to people's weddings. I've gone on family vacations. When Jonathan comes to Chicago, I'm sure we'll go to dinner, hopefully. Um, and, but we're, you know, it's a lot more personal for me. It's um, not just about business. It's about, I consider it helping my guests and me leave a legacy. And I was inspired to start by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and they were the only members of their family to survive. And his words and legacy live on. He's not alive anymore. But if you go to my about page on Inspired Insider, you could see a video, full video, um, of when the Holocaust Foundation interviewed him. Um, and his legacy lives on because of that interview. Um, and so it really inspires me. Obviously, I, you know, I think every business should have a podcast, period. But... Um, it also will help you leave a legacy. And so if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com or support at rise25media.com. So I want to introduce today's guest. Before I do, I want to give a big thank you to Chris Dreyer. Um, he's founder of rankings.io. He helps elite personal injury law firms dominate first page rankings. He was like, you need to have Jonathan on. You need to have Client Boost on. They're an amazing company. So thank you, Chris, for that. And um, He's exactly right after doing a lot of research. And also, two people I respect in the agency world, Ian Garlic, who runs Story Crews, and Jason Swank, who you know, helps top agencies grow. So we have Jonathan Dane. Uh, he's a founder of Client Boost. And so you can look up online. It's K-L-I-E-N-T Boost. And they're a hybrid PPC CRO agency that's grown from zero to eight figures in, in just the past few years. Um, and what they do is they are creative pay-per-click and paid social and landing page conversion rate optimization agency. Basically, they help you make money. You know, they're focused on profit. So um, they have over 200 active clients. So if you're a SaaS company, e-commerce company, a lead generation company, and you want more clients, call them. Um, now, the funny thing is, some people don't know this, some people do, um, but they actually do content marketing, technical SEO, and conversational marketing, meaning probably everything it takes to set up chatbots and actually lead people into that sale. Because probably their clients are like, hey, you're driving a lot of clients, we need more conversion, what are the other steps of conversion? I imagine, Jonathan, you correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And then they started doing that for people too, because that helps complete the sale. Um, and they basically focus on beautiful, high converting user experiences. Fun fact is he grew up in Denmark and played professional basketball. So Jonathan, thanks for joining me. <laughs> Thank you, man. That intro, I feel such like a little tiny peanut compared to the names that you uh, have had on the show. I'm grateful. Thank You're you. You're amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> and and um, we are just talking before we hit record that um, you um, were very close to getting acquired. Yes. <laughs> Before the pandemic coronavirus hit. 
Correct. We were about so three talk, weeks away. Yeah. Talk to me about maybe some of the conversations leading up, uh, anything you can share. And sure. then now. Um, yeah, I think, I think from a, from a founder perspective, um, if you had the chance to be acquired and you have the chance to get a, a nice payday, it's one of the, uh, you know, feathers in the cap entrepreneurial kind of like milestones that I think anybody would lie to if they said they weren't interested in that. <laughs> um, and so, and so we were, um, having a good amount of conversation, like our EBITDA and our, and our profit was growing, um, you know, along with our revenue. And did you, did you, yeah. um, actively seek that out more or would they, no. or they came no. to you or there were, there were three parties at the end of 2019 that were interested in us and they came knocking on our door. And so when I was having conversations with other people that I would call mentors or just people I trust, they're like, are you sure you don't want to like, you know, hire somebody to run shop for you and see what else is out there given the fact that three different companies are knocking on your door. And I was like, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And so I, I started um, doing my own little knocking on doors outside and didn't obviously have any success with it. So I just kept the conversations going with the three parties that were knocking on our door. So, yeah. So what happened leading up? So they're knocking on your door. What, what happened? <laughs> so there's a lot of um, due diligence. There's a lot of seeing like um, if, so in the world of, of agencies, there's two different options you have. You have the chance to be a platform where you continue to be the brand and you have the chance to be a bolt on or you're part of a bigger brand. Um, and so the conversation that we were having was being more of a bolt on and, um, you know, is the, that your the, preference? Uh, no, definitely not. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I could still keep the brand going of, of what we've been able to create as far as a snowball already, mm -hmm. I think that would be in the best interest if there was no emotions involved. S same with the people acquiring us. We just have a, a higher domain authority. Um, we were more well known. And so it would have been best for them to, to, to take our brand. But, you know, for me, I was like, what's more important for me? At the end of the day, I care about the money. That's why I started the business. I'm not going to lie. And so I needed that to make sense first. And then whatever they want to sell for scraps or parts later, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I didn't care for. Is there a concern with due diligence of like, they know our processes or internal things or clients or anything like so that? So I, so it's, it's interesting you ask. So we have a value set principle that's, that basically is an acronym that spells party. It stands for pushing ourselves, accountability, resilience, transparency, and a focus on you, which is like the client, right? Like you give us the feedback, you help dictate what we do in the future, how we make things better and all that kind of stuff. Once we get all that stuff done, we can celebrate and, and we do celebrate. So the, I'm ta talking about the transparency, you know, I have been tempted, I've thought about it, but it's like really doesn't do much of a favor to like literally disclose our entire client list and see if any agencies out there can try to poach them. Because if they can, it's the same as if like somebody's poaching your employee on LinkedIn. If they're able to do that, you shouldn't be upset. You should be more so look at yourself and say, why am I not doing a better job having a relationship with this client or this employee? Yeah. So the answer is no, I'm not concerned. Um, there's a lot of things that people need to copy and compel the brand, the tone, the personality of who we are, all that kind of stuff. The, the things that I think of as far as next steps of our own marketing, if they knew everything, which they do, um, you know, it's necessary to, to make the acquisition happen. So there's nothing, no way around that. And, you know, knowing my thoughts on it before, I'm, I'm not concerned about it. Yeah. It's interesting about that. First of all, I think that's the name of your like book after you sell or before you sell party and then some, some cool tagline <laughs> there. I, but, I um, think the name, I've, I thought about it. The name of my book is going to be called The Art uh, of Eating Shit. And it sounds horrible. But it's literally it all does, about it does sound horrible. <laughs> it's all about adversity, yeah. and I wanted I wanted to to look at other founders and things like that that have gone through things where like no this was shit when it happened, but now I'm loving it because it gave me gives me like these skills or or this focus or this mindset and things like that too. Yeah. So, anyways, but I could write another book called Party. That's yeah, fine. no, I yeah, it's <laughs> maybe more PC. But um, yeah, I'd ran Fishkin on with his book. I don't know if you read his book, but I think he would, he would, yeah, exactly. I think he would agree with that title anyways, with, uh, with his book, <laughs> you know what I mean? If anyone listens to yeah. that book, it's a lost and found a great book. And you know, that definitely, your title definitely encapsulates some of the stories <laughs> in there. Um, so the, the sale or potential sale made you realize yeah. a few things. It did. Um, and so 
what we found out was prior to the acquisition being underway, which starts with like a letter of intent, you know, phase, which is an exclusivity that usually lasts between 60 and 90 days. Um, what we had already thought of was, you know, we have a pretty agnostic sounding name at like client boost. Like, what does that matter? Or, and, and, or sorry, what does that mean? And you can argue that like, Hey, we help our clients boost or we get you more clients, which is, is fine. But the way we go about it doesn't matter. Um, and so we were thinking to ourselves, Hey, we built our own brand on content marketing. A lot of our clients are asking us about that. A lot of our clients are asking about email marketing or chatbot marketing. Um, why are we holding one hand behind our backs when it comes to this? And now with the pandemic underway, one of the fastest things we've realized is that advertising agencies are really in for a world of hurt because you have the advertising spend that a client can lower or just pause. And then you also have the agency fee of what we charge. So if you're a content marketing agency, you just have the cost of the content. You don't have an ad spend portion. Same thing with email. So we were at this like risky, um, in, in this risky spot where like we just weren't really prepared to like take hits or be part of a storm or anything like that either. Um, and so learning through the acquisition, what this bigger agency is doing and how they're doing it and all the data that they had to support it, I was like, okay, now we definitely have to go this route because it's like the future, like we should. It's a way to protect ourselves. It's a way to make more money from less clients, um, things like that, have longer contracts, like all the things that actually make you a stronger company, it was going that way. And the only thing that had me second guess or be not sure about that was we built our brand and our thought leadership in the world that we live in, which is you know paid ads and commercial optimization. If we start saying that we do radio advertising and billboard, like all these other things, then it could dilute and that's what I was afraid of. But now I'm like, I've seen it work, <laughs> you know, I don't care anymore. Like it is going to work. So that's what we're going for. You've seen it work because you saw that through that other company through the due diligence process. Correct. Correct. It is a legitimate point, right? A lot of people say, listen, focus, you know, right. focus and double down on what you're good at. Um, so it's a balance. So how do you decide going forward? Now you have other things that people can Mm -hmm. can utilize how you decide certain things you probably decided not to do and certain right. things. So talk about the things you're going forward going to do and maybe some of the things you decided we were not going to do that. Yeah. Um, a real specific example is like we could have offered social media management, which is like the organic way of posting on social media, but the attribution of that and proving that it makes money is a little tougher unless you're actually already a well-known brand. And if you are, you're probably not going to give the keys to the kingdom to us, right? Like you're going to, keep doing what you're doing. Um, so that was a, that was an aspect of life. It was well, on the table, but like it got on the chopping block. It got, it got, it got chopped because it's not easy to prove ROI from it. And so all the things that I do and want to do for myself and even for our clients, is I'll prioritize only the things that I know can have an effect and an impact in that way that we can prove. And so that's, that's, one, yeah, that's one reason why the other reason why is just like, I've had so many talks with other agency owners. I run, um, a community called Growth Comet with um, a buddy named Ross Hudgens out of Siege Media. And we also have insight into like agencies from around, there's over like hundred agencies as part of that community, like what they do, what works, what doesn't. And they're obviously there to like learn from us. Um, cool. There's a lot of- What's the, what's the site? People go check it out. It's growthcomet.com. C-O-M-E-T.com. Yep. If okay, it looks cool. like you uh, are seeing a flaming meatball, you're in the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the cover art for your, for your book. Also. <laughs> <laughs> That's the third book. <laughs> um, so yeah, you were saying growth comments because you have insights yeah. into that. So through the due diligence process was like the most clear insight, like, okay, you know, this bigger agency has bigger retainers than us, but not necessarily bigger client. Like, like the, the, the size of the company as a client itself is not necessarily bigger. And then, you know, it was, it was very logical then to have the conversation understanding that like, Hey, the more hooks you have in a client, the more services you have in a client, the harder it is for that client to just say, Hey, we're letting you guys all go. And you're going to try to replace us by hiring us in house. Like, like good luck. Like that's not going to be easy. Plus we have them, those different marketing services communicate with each other. Like there's going to be, I hate using the word synergies, but there literally is because of the recipes that we have. And like, usually a lot of companies will have them operate in silos. Mm -hmm. They won't understand mm -hmm. the conversion intent of different traffic sources yeah. and what that means from a CTA. And you know, I can get really technical about that. Yeah. 
There's a so, pain of breakage, you know, like if you break one of these pieces, the rest kind of breaks also. There's a pain of disconnect there if they stop. Are you talking about like when you get the breads at the restaurant or? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we had, so we had the, like the, I would say qualitative feedback from Growth Comet and understanding and seeing that and also just knowing other marketing agencies that do have this holistic focus or sorry, a, a single focus where we're trying to be more holistic. And it just gives us so much more freedom and wiggle room and actually yeah. allows us to just get results faster for the client. We can, like, it's that, it's that analogy of like the, the, the rising tide is lifting all the boats. Um, and so we're doing it for ourselves. We can do it for other clients. And it's, it's so far with a few clients that we have that we're testing this with, it's working really, really well. Yeah, I could see because like one of our principles also at Rise 25 is like we have an ROI filter. So, you know, if it's not going to produce ROI, so that, that seemed to be kind of one of the things you looked at when you were like, here's the services we could do, mm-hmm. but these are the ones are, you can directly track to ROI yeah. and the other ones, we don't want to do that. They may right. get ROI, it may not, it may be better for branding, but you're not branding, you're like least, direct response. Yeah, at least we won't prioritize them. So we yeah. might do them in the future, but not now before the other ones. Yeah. And it was interesting. Um, so thank you for that conversation around focus. Cause I know I always struggle with that, with that whole <laughs> conversation in my head and now other people do. Um, the other piece, and we'll get to the contrarian thing. So I like about you is you go contrarian on certain things, but you mentioned Ross and siege media and you had a really yeah. interesting conversation with Ross that I was watching. And what was cool is uh, interesting that, you know, you help your clients, you know, SaaS, lead gen, e-com, get clients yeah. um, through paid media. Mm-hmm. Um, what was interesting is how you got a lot of your clients. Right. Yeah. So talk about that. So we invest and I have a heavy, heavy focus on brand um, and content marketing. So all of our clients and all of our growth to hit our recent milestone, which was a, the 10 million um, annual recurring revenue um, has come through our content, our thought leadership. And like, it's such a no brainer if you can have the long-term patience, but still being able to execute and see that your, you know, every blog post or every piece of content you come out with is literally just planting a seed for it to be harvested later. That's literally what it is. Or not literally, that's stupid to say because it's not uh, an actual crop, but, uh, you get what I mean. (laughs) So, so that's, that's the funny thing that we've done where, you know, early days of client boost, I looked at the landscape. I looked at what I thought was, this is really much like the uniformity across all agencies. They all look very identical. They all look alike. You know, how can we differentiate, which is a big focus that I still think of that I'm very excited about our rebrand and our refresh and our redesign that we're coming out with. Um, But it all started with, you know, that lemonade stand principle that I shared in that interview where the internet is like a street. And on that street are all the different agencies that somebody can think of. And if there's not a way for you to like continually give value or scratch backs or give high fives to your content or whatever you're doing, then you're going to look identical to everything else on that street. It's just how people are going to perceive you. Um, so the, the things that I mentioned in the, in the video is how do you focus on making your lemonade stand the best looking lemonade stand out there? You have your your social proof, you have other people talking about you, which in the digital world can be reviews, testimonials, video case studies, you know, things like that. Um, And then you also have the ability to make sure that your uniform is the best looking. You have organic lemons, you have the best ice cubes, not the cube ones, but like the crunchy little nugget ones, right? Uh, You have the best looking glasses, like you have the, like you just have that customer experience focus. And then to actually take that and put it into action a lot of people talk about it. A lot of people think it's cool and they agree with it, but they can't continuously execute on it. And they're not willing to audit themselves to make sure they keep doing that. So, so to your original question, like the content was a pillar to building a brand. And that is one of the hardest things to do in a very, very saturated market. Because if you think about it, we are marketers marketing against other marketers to attract marketers to be our clients. <laughs> I don't know if, Right. Another, I don't know of another harder thing to say. It's like if we're going to make this work and not fall in the trap of like only asking for referrals or only tapping our network for the next client, then like how do we make sure that we are very successful? Yeah. And it was starting with 
you know, content. Yeah, one of the things you mentioned on that talk and in general, which I thought was interesting is one of the other reasons why is when you are advertising or um, in your in other places, it's a comparison engine. So they're looking at you side by side with your competitor. And like Google, if you have Google it is. Yeah, Google. I mean, even, even Facebook, you know, there's, you can see comparisons out there. Um, and so the content, you're kind of standalone. Like this is us. This is what we serve. This is, you know, the value we deliver. And so right. you're kind of a standalone. Um, it's kind of like what I picture when I get, you know, if you ever get those Google AdWords uh, mailers, like if you notice, they're sending direct mail to get customers, even mm. though they own Google AdWords, <laughs> right? Well, it's a, it's a point. What I love about that point is that once you have a channel of acquisition that works for you, keep improving it, but now go on to the next one. And so Google is obviously has a lot of money. They can do a lot of things and experiment with it. I'm sure it works for them, but yeah, yeah. they own it. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the, con so, you know, when I looked you up, Jonathan, I told you I do a lot of research. I found so many articles and blogs, and uh, which is great and terrible for my research because now I'm like, I got to <laughs> look at all these. But, you know, I think you're on like HubSpot and you have like a profile there and you got articles there and everywhere. What's been a big, you remember early on that gave you, that started the flywheel? The, 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 the accelerant or like the enzyme that uh, was a, the catalyst to our, our growth was a contrarian, again, like going against the grain, mm -hmm. uh, opposite approach, uh, article that I wrote for Unbounce, which is a landing page software. And I basically wrote an article that said, <laughs> and it wasn't even my idea with the headline. And if they didn't use this headline, I, it wouldn't, I don't know if we would have been where we're at today. I don't know if I'd be talking to you, honestly. Um, they wrote the headline that says, you're doing AdWords wrong, which is the old name for Google ads. Uh, here's how to do it right. And you know, I just started getting flooded with comments. There was at some point, and I don't, I haven't checked it recently, but it was up to a point of like 400 comments in a blog post. And I'm like, I've never seen that anywhere else. And people were like, hey, how do we, how do, we do this? Like, how do, we, how do we run this execution within our Google Ads account? Um, and so a lot of it, I think, I think I personally inflated the numbers of comments because of my replies, I, but I don't remember. That's the way you're supposed uh, to do it. Yeah, but that was that was back in like 2014. So I was a co-founder of another agency and then, you know, did my own thing and moved back to Southern California to start Client Boost. Um, that was it. And I think a lot and, and actually um, uh, Rand Fishkin, uh, who again, Lawson founder, author, now founder of Spark Toro, mm -hmm. um, talks about contrarian marketing, like how valuable it is as long as you can back it up. Because after I came out with that article, it became very normal. And we saw a lot of accounts that had the structure that we recommended, which is a single keyword ad group structure, but our execution was specific. Um, and again, people are trying to like knock it down to be contrarian against that, but it's only going to work if they actually have, you know, uh, an execution or, or stats or data to support it because if not, it's just your opinion. And so it looks foolish. So we had the data, we had the facts and we had the contrarian opinion and that like took off. So what other opinions or maybe expand on that, that you have that are contrarian, whether it's in running an agency oh. or marketing? Um, I think that differentiation by itself is very contrarian, obviously, but I think what people struggle with is the, uh, how do you uh, look at that black and white? How do you make it objective? Um, so an example that I can give you is agencies, you know, most, most marketing agencies suck at marketing themselves. <laughs> they just do. Um, the ones that do really well are the ones who invest in illustrations, like custom stuff, right? The ones that take professional photos and not just like, Hey, give me your iPhone. I'm going to take it. Like they're acting like every detail matters. Like literally, if you ask my entire team to send you an email, there is a space between our, our, um, little banner that we have in the email and the dash line beneath it. And if I see that there's a, like an extra space, I like flip out in a nice way. Like I'm not a dick. Like I, I don't want to think that. I don't, I, tell, I don't see you flipping out in a mean way. But yeah. <laughs> I tell our brand designer that I'm like, Hey, you know, we need to fix this now. Like every single thing matters. Mm. So that's, that's one piece. The other piece is like, let's look at it through the lens of content marketing. Differentiation there is um, any, any focus keyword that you're trying to get your blog post to rank for. 
if you are seeing that your competitors have a listicle, which is basically a list of an article, right? That's what's called a listicle. Um, and, the, and the points that they have is more or higher than what you're posting, don't even publish. Like you're not gonna get anything like as far as like, again, just looking at it from the lemonade stand principle, people are gonna judge you, they're gonna pick a, an article. And if you, you know, your competitors has 21 ways to perform better with podcast marketing, you're gonna publish one with seven, get the F out of here. Like, why would you <laughs> make any sense? Like, don't even do that. So things like that. Also first party data, like the day that you can actually come out with first party data is a day that your brand starts taking off from a marketing perspective, because you are the source of truth. You are the citation. Mm -hmm. Nobody can go beyond you. Like you have to be cited. You have to be linked to. Um, so those are just a few things that like are really important. So let's uh, talk about that for a second. Um, <clears throat> talking about, being the source, right? You have a lot of, you go, if someone goes on Client Boo's website, I was on it yesterday and today, um, you have a whole page of case studies, okay? Right. And it lists a bunch of SaaS. I mean, you could even click via category, SaaS, lead gen, e -com. If someone's right. looking to do an actual case study page on their website, I suggest you look at clientboost.com <laughs> case study because it puts people to shame. It puts us to shame. We're like we need to step up our game when it comes to this thing. <laughs> well, what's you know? crazy? What's crazy is that yeah. the page that you see is actually an unbounce page. It's not part of our actual website. Mm. It's a test, and we have. I sent you a Google Drive folder. I don't know if you can share it with the with yeah. the listeners. Um, but but our actual amount of case studies are like over 120, and like the ones on the website, I think it's like 20. So yeah. we have way more. But thank you. <laughs> yeah, it looks you know the way it's, it's structure is really good. And, and I say it because you're like, you know, ShipStation, Ad Espresso, Autopilot. I know you have companies that you work with, Bloomberg, Stanford University. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to talk about one of them, like as a use case, because it'd be valuable for people to hear. And I know a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of people I know in SaaS and e-commerce, but yeah. e-commerce specifically. Um, and on the kind of contrarian um, topic, of yeah. case studies, maybe one of the e-commerce case studies that's maybe took some contrarian thinking. Sure, for sure. Um, the one that I'll highlight in this case is the one um, called Latote. And I don't know if it's on our website, but I'll it share is. it with you. It is, 263% increase in conversion rate. Okay, cool. Rate, yeah. so, so one of the things that um, could help everybody listening too is that when, when we think of how we execute anything marketing related, I think of it in, in the terms of recipes, like how, how simple can I make this so that everybody can bake the same cake and have the same outcome. Um, and that goes across like our own marketing when we are doing ads or content or podcasts or whatever, our salespeople when they're talking about it, and then our fulfillment or operations when they're doing the actual work for the client. If I can't make it a recipe, I really don't care about it. Like I, I don't try to make it like that interesting or I just, you know, don't do it. So Latote specifically, um, what was really, really interesting about them is that uh, this was early days of Client Boost. We were just hired on to just do the Google ad side and the landing page side. The paid social they had pretty much narrowed, narrowed down, or uh, sorry, nailed down, and they weren't looking for help with that. They just wanted to scale um, the Google side. So what we did was we exhausted the impression share of all search traffic. And in search, there's basically four buckets of conversion intent that you can be pretty sure of. There's your brand, which is you know great. The more you have of that, great ROI, great return on ad spend. Then you have competitor traffic, then you have generic traffic, and then you have informational traffic. Informational can be symptom related or like what, where, how, you know, things like that. Um, and they all convert at different rates. And also, if you can get it to convert and you are a lead gen or you are a SaaS company, and I'm not talking e-commerce because e-commerce, the sale happens on the site, right? It's very black and white. You can get that ROAS and see the full picture very quickly. Legion and SaaS, there's usually an offline component. Yeah. Um, and there may so, be a demo, there may be like a couple exactly. conversations, yeah. So, so a lot of people, when they do tracking to revenue, they do it at the campaign level. Um, what they don't do, which they should do, is they have enough volume is that they do down to the keyword level. But even better than that, your search term level, and I don't wanna get too technical, so you tell me where I should go. Go ahead, go ahead. So basically in, in Google ads world, the search this, term. This is the section of your e-commerce. Are you actually <laughs> doing this stuff? You should listen. If not, well, this, just, this, is just, this is just on the search side. This, we're not even talking shopping yet. So um, also at, recently, a few years ago, Google came out with making shopping ads and listings free as a retaliation against Amazon. 
just to get more advertisers on Google Shopping, uh, which is pretty rad. So um, what was I talking about? I forgot. You were saying the search level, keyword oh, yeah, level. Yeah. So, so, so search term is what people actually type in and the keyword is what you actually bid on. In 99% of the time, your keywords and your search terms have a pretty wide discrepancy. So it's not enough to just bucket your campaigns in those four buckets of intent that I already mentioned. It's also really important that you keep mining your search terms, not just for negative keywords, but making sure that they actually correlate to the correct keyword. Because depending on the keyword match type you're using, it can skew your data very, very quickly. So if you are doing any type of revenue tracking for lead gen and SaaS, which Latote is partly also um, a SaaS company, not just e-commerce company, um, it's important that you have the data clean because when you get it into your Salesforce or whatever CRM you're using, you're not going to be able to act on it. And if you do, it's not going to be data that's accurate to act on. And then you're going to screw yourself when you actually go back into the platforms, ad platforms. So we had exhausted, going back to my point, we had exhausted the search volume of impressions that we can get. And we can see that through impression share. Google basically tells us, you know, of all the traffic available for these keywords, you know, how much, how often are you showing up in Google for that? So, our point of contact over at Lato was like, hey, how do we do display advertising? And display advertising are usually the banner ads that you see. And a lot of people say, you know, display advertising is just for awareness. Uh, and I'm like, it's not like anything can be direct response. Like I can advertise on a trash can. And if you give me enough time and resources, I'm going to make that make money for you. Uh, it obviously depends on what we're marketing and all that kind of stuff too. But like a lot of people speak in absolutes, which I'm a big, big, uh, I hate, I hate it when they do that because it's just not true. It also shows that they haven't even tried to be creative or try to solve a problem. Mm. So anyways, we were trying to do um, advertising on display network and we can target fashion blogs and things like that. And just so you guys know too, Latote, um, for the people who don't know, is a company that's a competitor to Stitch Fix, which is basically allowing to send you, um, you know, shipments of clothes that it thinks you'll like based off your own profile and your own onboarding. So it kind of rotates through that. You can decide to keep some of them if you want and things like that too, just so you have that frame uh, yeah. of knowledge. So the display side, we were trying to target, you know, females who were on fashion blogs and trying to get them to actually come through and create an account or buy an individual product did not work. We even tried to give a 50% off discount did not work. So what we did instead was we paired the call to action, what we want them to do with the temperature, the conversion intent of the traffic, which is very cold for display traffic in general. If you're doing remarketing where like the ad follows you around because you've already been on the site, that's a different type of traffic. That's higher intent. They already know about you. We're talking about like net new eyeballs to come through. What we did instead was we took an interim offer. We didn't ask them to onboard and create an account and buy, you know, clothes we asked them to sign up for their newsletter. And the landing page for the newsletter was all about the benefits and the features of the newsletter. It didn't even talk about Lato. And so we're thinking, okay, these people who are on these fashion blogs, they're gonna click the ad. They're not gonna have a high intent to like go through this onboarding quiz and swipe their credit card at the end. But to fill out an email form to get value in terms of the newsletter might make a lot of sense. So we tested that, it started working. Then on the thank you page, this is the most important part, on the thank you page of that newsletter landing page, was the original call to action to onboard as a regular Latote, you know, new customer. And because we put in a in-between spot that was more in line with what they're okay with, it's kind of, if I asked you, Hey, can you send me a million dollars? You're going to be like, no, I don't even know you, Jonathan. I'm like, well, if I do a ton of work before you and trust you and like, you can basically name your son after me or whatever, then maybe one day you'll give me a million dollars, but it's called the yes ladder. And it's a sales technique that we then have called the breadcrumb technique which is like the Hansel and Gretel children's story and all that kind of stuff to like, we're slowly progressively asking things that are increasing in threat level to the visitor to yeah. then get to do the ultimate thing we want them to do. Yeah. It's funny when you say that I'm picturing just at the end, kids being locked into a cage. They're yeah. like, Oh, here's the, the end. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I coined of a that cage. term. I coined <laughs> that term very quickly and I didn't think it all the way through. And I was like, no, it's <laughs> I go with it. <laughs> yeah. In this yeah, case, it's I, a happy place where they become a customer and all that stuff. They get fattened up. They get all the candy and like they can eat the house and like it's all right. like it, exactly, awesome. exactly. Yeah. And they survive. Like it's okay. Like they're not like it, the 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 fate is not what you think it is. Well, your Danish background. Like my favorite course in uh, I went to University of Wisconsin Madison was Scandinavian literature, and we studied the tales of Hans Christian Andersen, and we actually dissected oh, cool. <laughs> dissected those. 
um, you know, maybe your Danish background, you know, uh, lends itself to that <laughs> particular analogy. Um, so, yeah, I love that. Anything else on the contrarian approach from from Latote that would be important to note? Yeah, so so we we find these recipes, and then what we also do, going back to the differentiation perspective, is we coin these terms. So we make them famous, and we just call them something. We call we have the breadcrumb technique, the iceberg effect, the mob effect, the gold pan technique, things like that. And um, what's your favorite? one that you uh, the, the you're one the one that works almost very universally is definitely the breadcrumb technique because it's the okay. same thing if we're doing email marketing for clients and let's say that we're doing cold outbound email um most cold outbound emails like start talking about you know who they are and like what they do and like nobody gives an f like you're emailing me like i don't care about who you guys are instead you need to ask them for like a small thing you need to ask them for a small step like again it's it's again the the breadcrumb the yes ladder approach so, so that yes ladder for, breadcrumb to, uh, equivalent is that like yeah so the yes ladder is basically a sales technique and the breadcrumb technique is then we just stole that and then we turn it into a marketing related form and we call it the breadcrumb technique got it um so, so that's really helpful and then the other thing last thing i'll lead yeah. off with is uh, the gold pan technique, um, the mob effect, single product ad groups are very e-commerce focused, but they're all rooted in what we focus on very heavily, which is granularity. Like we break things down to force them to prove that they make money for us or our clients. And so when we do that, we have more control versus giving the ad platform control. And that helps out a ton too. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And and I love the, the granularity and detail on it. And I think you know, people who are doing this stuff will totally appreciate that. And even, yeah. even if not, if you know, if you're not doing this, one thing that he just said that you use, like just having something on your thank you page. I mean, just this stuff in general, is super valuable on a high level. You know, mm -hmm. most people may not have anything on their offer, a thank you page. They may even not even have a thank you page, Jonathan. Well, so, so let me, let me add some flavor to that. So ahead. if you're B2B or lead gen, when you are you know, having people sign up for a demo or a consultation or getting a price quote, whatever the CTA might be, doing the breadcrumb technique and actually having a multi-step form will work better. You never ask for name, email, and phone number on the first impression. Never do that. If you go to our website, you'll see that we live by those words. We have a three-step process. It works tremendously well. All of our case studies, if you look at them, have the breadcrumb technique mentioned because it's a multi-step form. Mm -hmm. but here's the kicker. On the thank you page, if you don't tell you know, when you're the person who just converted, when they're going to be reached out to by what number you're going to call them, what area code, because again, the day of robo callers, people are not even answering calls. They don't know anymore. Um, you don't tell them what the next step is. You're really hampering your speed towards the sale. Um, and so those are just some quick wins that you can take care of. Yeah. So many good questions I have, but, um, <laughs> you know, one thing I want to take us to your page, you know, if people go to clientboost.com you see this really nice graphical um, page and you have get your B2B coronavirus PPC CRO proposal now. Yeah. Okay. And get my free proposal. Tell me about the free proposal. So the proposal is basically what we like. So comparing to other agencies, what we found is that people, you know, have a consultation um, as a call to action. People have, um, a quote as a call to action. The proposal is the only thing that we split tested over time that actually had some tangible value because we also explain what's in the proposal. Once you click that button, actually the pop up. Um, Let me back up for one second. Yeah. I'll, is who's a who's a good client for you? Like who should actually be? So you know. So the I'll tell you like very black and white. If you have at least thirty employees or spend at least ten thousand dollars on marketing a month, you are a good client for us whether that's ad spend, whether that's content marketing, doesn't really matter. Yeah. So don't flood as get my free proposal if you're not one of those things. <laughs> but, uh, you can, we'll just, we'll just disqualify you automatically. Yeah. But we have, we have the, you know, the volume of case studies in all these different categories um, because our recipes work very well across the board, which we're really excited about. Yeah, I think in one of the interviews, this was like dated back, you're like, we, I forgot if you said we get 500 leads a day or there was some- No, we get a month. Oh, <laughs> a month? month? I was <laughs> like, that's still good. Uh, but yeah, it's still amazing. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Sorry to interrupt. So yeah. So get my proposal, get my yeah. free proposal. I mean, um, then what happens, what happens next? So basically depending on the, um, 
ad spend dropdown you select, it gets routed to the appropriate, you know, executive, the salesperson on our side. But the more important part happens when, um, what it basically entails is that we give you um, a discovery call. We understand what your goals are, what your challenges are. Like, you know, people might want to, you know, lower their cost per acquisition and, or they might want to get more volume depending on, and we also have to understand like, well, how many platforms are you on? Things like that. So that's like an information gathering phase. Then we get access to your accounts or your Google Analytics. We then, with your goals, go in and find all the low-hanging fruits that are based off our own first-party data, our case studies, and then we present to you like a 30-minute run-through through a Zoom call um, on like, here's the starting action plan. Like if we were to work together with you, this is exactly what we would do, and we're going to give you all of this so that you have it. And the reason why people hire us is because we're the fastest at executing it, and we've done it so many times. That's why they trust us. But if you want to, you're more than welcome to do it yourself. Like we give you that option. So, you know, Jonathan, I see that valuable in itself. Mm -hmm. Do you typically charge for, cause you're kind of doing an analysis of their account for them. Right. Um, no, do we you don't charge, charge for that. Or have you ever, have you ever charged for it? We never charge for it. Um, there's only a few times where people have asked us to come on site and train their internal team. Um, where it's just like a very, very much, much deeper dive, longer approach way more holistic looking kind of thing. Um, but no, we don't charge for it. Okay. That's, that's generous of you. Um, <laughs> yeah. at what point did you, I imagine in the beginning you were doing these calls. I was. Yeah. Yeah. And so what point did you actually stop doing these calls? So I was handling, cause that's a lot of calls. Like it gives you 500, even if you just well, so, a certain that, number, that's like what it's still a lot of calls. Pay. That's not yeah. what it was early on, obviously. Okay. But what I did early on was I, I wish I would have gone faster and delegated quicker because I just was such, and I still to this day am such a perfectionist. And I just, not that I micromanage or anything like that, but I'm just like, hey, if it's anything marketing related, I got to do it right. Like I got to do it. I can't give that to anybody else. So I was handling 16 clients by myself, probably like $60,000 of monthly recurring revenue in like the first early days of Client Boost. Um, and then I was doing the marketing and I was doing the sales. Now we have a team That's of a like, yeah. now we have a team of four salespeople. Um, and then I come in on the more strategic ones, like the bigger ones and say hi and, and lend my thoughts. What do you look for in a salesperson? Do you look for someone who's like actually been trained as a salesperson or more someone who's just, you know, really down with PPC, like an expert at PPC? How do you? So, so the latter. And the reason why is because it's so technical that you can't like, Again, we're marketing against other marketers to attract other marketers. Like their bullshit meters at an all-time high. Um, if it's just a random salesperson, and there's a lot out there that marketing agencies rely on, but we found the person who's already an account manager is the best person to turn into a salesperson. So, do you start them in as an account manager and they graduate, or yeah. does, or is it just a totally separate position? Uh, no, it's it's uh, the first one you said. Like we mm. start as an account manager, and then. Um, again with the, so they go through the pros like, this sounds amazing, Jonathan, like, <laughs> let's do this. I want to get more leads. I want to get sure. uh, more conversions on leads. Then how does it work after that? So we basically I imagine with this, it's a lot of rolling up your sleeves and doing a lot of work. Like how does the onboarding? It, it, so, so here's, what's crazy too. Um, we build our own software called kite that actually scans the accounts for those recipes and finds the outliers for us. Now, can so people it, buy that or does it so, only for internal purposes? So through the acquisition um, and all the private equity firms that we've talked to, they're like, don't have it as a separate company, which I thought to begin with, we should have. And, and, and so now we're moving it internally. So we still have other agencies that are using it and all that kind of stuff that are having but You're not going to let anyone else use it. Correct. Except if they're already using it. Correct. And well, they're, we're just going to like let them dry out themselves if they cancel um, or we're just going to tell them like, Hey, in 60 days, we're going to, we're going to stop offering the service. The reason why is not only is it great from a sales perspective, but it's also great from current clients where manually as humans, we cannot be overseeing the yeah. 200 clients that we have and still do the strategic work. So like we have to get pinged by our software kite when things fall outside of the norm that we didn't have to go check manually mm -hmm. on. So, but the interesting thing is that regardless of you being lead gen or e-commerce or SaaS, a lot of these recipes apply to you. And so when you actually look at our proposals that we send, the starting action plans are very similar. And 
everybody thinks they're getting a custom proposal, which they are, because these are the things that are going to help them improve in goals. But the truth is because we've simplified it so much, we've been able to make it a lot quicker. Yeah. I mean, also you disqualify certain people that don't fit into that. Maybe that, you know, you'd have to customize more if you took, you know, certain types of businesses or too small or whatever. So it's going to be, it's going to be more of a challenge once we actually come out and offer our other services and like that prospect wants, you know, all the services. Um, that's when it's going to take a lot longer. So the kite, it gives you a proprietary edge against your, any competitors, it mm-hmm. seems. Um, but you did decide at one point to release it, to have yeah. other people use it. Um, and so the acquisition, people are like, yeah, keep this internal because that, they'll get the edge. Right, exactly. So, so right now, people cannot get it. Like, they can you know, today if they want to, but like the support of um, the outward facing benefits and features of it are, are some of them are being deprecated to focus more on what we needed to be internally instead. So they're not going to get the best experience, but you can today go sign up for it and use it right away. Not that I want to flood you with a bunch of kite users, but <laughs> you know, so people, you know, it's a scarcity. If you're like, I can't get it, I better get it now before they get acquired. Uh, right. <laughs> you yep. never know. Um, I'm curious of some of the lessons you learned. You had another and built another agency. Mm-hmm. in Utah. So yeah. what are some of the lessons you learned from that that you took over to Client Boost? Um, so before so before going to Utah, I was there for about like a year and a half. Um, they, the point, like my co-founder, the CEO there now, he was my client um, at the time. And I was a college senior, um, basically doing nothing but work, marketing work while in class. And he was seeing what I was doing on a small scale and say, hey, I had the more enterprise background and the connections would you consider, you know, working together? And so my girlfriend at that time, now wife, and I drove to, to Utah and we're like, this place sucks. <laughs> no, 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 no harmful, you know, I've thoughts, never been like, there. So. Great people, but compared to Orange County, Southern California, like, come on. And I'm, I, again, I left Denmark to come to California. So you know that I'm not about the seasons. I don't like even Chicago. You can't find Oh, me. it's terrible like, in Chicago. It's so that freeze, dinner you freezing about, here. Yeah, yeah. The dinner you talked about, it better be over here not over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless it's like two months of the year in the summer, then you'll, you're sure. fine here. Yeah. Actually, I was at Lollapalooza a couple of years back. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. See, there you go. Just, a, just <laughs> only a two months hours. span. Only yeah, a two months span. For like a couple hours. Just wanted to experience, and it was pretty funny. Um, so what I learned was, to, to honestly, like it sounds super cliche, but it was like, okay, I can do this. Like I'm talking to Red Hat. Uh, I'm talking to Citrix. I'm talking to Cars.com. Like. Mm. And I'm impressing them. It gave you the permission to do it on your own. Did, did it, it, gave, it gave you permission just because oh. you're like, Oh, like, well, I'm, yeah. So what, so what happened was the, the founder and, and we've had our differences and we've a lot better friends now than what we just were maybe a couple years ago. You know, I was over operations. I was doing all the account management work, making sure everybody had what they had. Then I started being in charge of the marketing. Then I started being in charge of sales. And at that point I was like, well, I know everything now. And I feel like I can do it better than my co-founder. Honestly, that was like my, and if he hears this, I hope he does. It's just the truth. I felt like I could do it better. And that gave me all the confidence I needed to be like, okay, I'm going to go back to where we're from. We also knew it was temporary in Utah. We weren't going to be there forever. Cause again, we're not Mormon or anything like that. And again, love the people are awesome people, but we're just away from our family. Like we were gonna, we got married while we were out there in, in Temecula, California, while we lived there. And like, we were going to start our family and all that kind of stuff too. So it's just a matter of time. What about lessons from, you know, cause you guys have grown, grown fast uh, as most people's standards from client boost, um, any hiring, um, you know, onboarding sales, any of those things that lessons that you're like, Oh, I'll, I'll do this better or I won't do it this way. Or maybe some stuff you took from it. Um, the only thing that was different was the way that we were approaching marketing and like, I wanted to build a brand and I want to be different. Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't have, I wasn't seeing eye to eye with, with the co-founder about that. And so that was the biggest lesson. But one thing that has helped us out so much right now, especially during these times when everybody's like, Oh my God, am I going to get laid off? Am I going to get fired? And they're not sure is like operate from like radical transparency and actually do it. Like everybody at the company knows our profits. Everybody at the company knows exactly what we're spending our money on. Like I'm opening the book. And again, I'm not concerned about anybody copying it or running away with it because it's, it's five years of work. Like you can start, sure. But if you're not that person yourself, if you're not having that personality, if you're not fun 
or slightly immature like I am sometimes too, it's not going to come across as authentic and you're not going to have results. I, you, you, so the transparency aspect is really helpful because I'll give you an example of when coronavirus hit and we did lay off some people, but we use it more as a preemptive measure to lay off people who were not performing well and people who were more newly hired that didn't have a full plate because we did take a hit in clients that left or clients that paused. Um, and people then came and asked like, Hey, can you give me a, like a guarantee that I'm not going to be like, Oh, I'm like, like to your face over zoom, obviously <laughs> I was yeah. like, I can't promise you that. And here, here's exactly why. And I'm just laying out the steps. And right. so even if it's good news or bad news, operating off transparency is very helpful. Now people that I've been in like entrepreneurs organizations like EO and all that kind of stuff. And I remember there was one founder who was like deathly afraid of her team even to know her revenue. And I'm like, what are the benefits of that? The pros far outweigh the cons when you're transparent. And as long as you can tell your people on your team that these are your rules for the game, that they have to play by your rules, then you can't really have anybody who gets upset as long as, again, you're being honest and direct and transparent. And so that was the biggest thing where I was like, okay, even more so because I wasn't a CEO then, now I am, how am I going to operate? What what do you think was that person's objection that people like they saw how big the company would be so they would have you know they would ask they would ask for more money I, so, I'm the, that's the thing that i think they would be concerned about and so how do you get what would you what did you say to that person or how do you say like, well that's here's how you can make more money the way that you make more money at client boost is that you make the company more money first and then the other part to it is like what's the market rate for your position like I can help you make more money and we can put a growth track together to get you to where you want to make. But if you're at, let's say $80,000 a year today and you want to get to 50 or $500,000, I'm going to tell you flat out that's not going to happen. And if you really think that you're going to do that anywhere else as an employee, be my guess, but you're not. Instead, I'm going to give you the honest answer and the honest feedback and show you here are the glass door average salaries, <laughs> you know, pick anywhere in the country you want. If it's New York, you probably won't even get close to that number anyways. Um, so again, the transparency and the honesty and the truth yeah. has always been very, very helpful. Can you, this is interesting, Jonathan. Can you talk to me about a conversation? Cause you know, you want that your staff to win. You have some amazing staff. I looked up one of them has got like a YouTube channel, of like 70,000 people. I think <laughs> um, on it. Um, I watched one of his videos. He's yeah. shout out to him. He's funny. Um, but, uh, when you had that conversation, you sat down because you really want to help them grow within your company because that benefits the company, benefits them. Can you talk to me? And you don't have to mention names, but someone's like, listen, here's where I'm at. Here's one where I want to go. And like you help walk through, here's the path. Sure. And they followed it. Yeah. The, the first thing is like, you know, do as you say you're going to do is really important. Like con consistency with what you're saying too. And so in the last, in, in 2000, 18 and 19, those two years in a row, the company actually made less profit uh, year over year compared to 2017, which is kind of crazy. Why is that? And it's because we invested in our software. It's because we invested in a middle management layer that, uh, and we gave raises and all that kind of stuff. And so when I show people that I chose to take less money home, even though I technically still make more than them, but I chose to take less money more because I'm investing in the business and I'm giving raises to these other people who are in those positions, it kind of puts away their their, their weapons, like their ammo is gone, right? There's not really anything they can point and say, Hey, you're just a greedy CEO and you just want to make more money. And I tell them the same, I want to make more money. Like you want to make more money too. So the way that we look about it is if you're an account manager, for example, you, you average a certain monthly recurring revenue that you're handling. That is like whatever the clients you're handling are paying us. You can either raise the revenue by hitting the goals of those clients, which is like, you know, a good incentive in of itself. So you don't have to add more clients to your list or you add, it's my dog, sorry. Or you add more clients. Those are the only two options. Now, if you want to be going above that and becoming a manager or a director beyond that, here are the things that you'd have to hit. And that's also spelled out black and white. And so, and like we were growing at the rate where like we couldn't say like, oh, here are the next 10 steps for your career because we hadn't made those like those uh, positions yet. Like they're, we're still working on them. Yeah. Someone can grow within their position or they can grow into a different position is what mm -hmm. you're saying. And right. then do you have a specific, um, you know, obviously I remember interviewing someone, you know, and they said um, that, you know, money is the least motivating 
you know, appreciation, like all those things are more motivating to someone, but yeah. you know, people still want to, you know, obviously make more money. There's certain bonus structures that you've seen um, or ways to appreciate people, whether it's money or not money that you yeah. found. Have I been think, really- I think the lead. So, so we actually do what's called a disc assessment of all our people that we hire. So we have like this, I would call like a scientific black and white motivational benchmark that we know and the best performing people are the ones at client groups with a high dominance. The people who have a high really? dominance are usually motivated by money. <laughs> so that's why I started there. But on top of that, um, because we built, you know, some thought leadership, because we have a brand, um, people are really happy and excited when they can publish their blog posts on the client boost blog. Or, you know, if I put them in, in, you know, if any other podcast wants to interview them because I don't have time or whatever, like that is a big plus. So they're like using client boost. And I tell them this use this as a stepping stone. And right now um, I also told them that I'm, I'm doing a test on LinkedIn with my content that I'm publishing there to see if I can get like a lot of engagement. And I am I'm getting like over a hundred reactions per post and a lot of comments and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm just getting started. And I told them like, Hey, if this works, I want to roll this out for you guys so that we can be a force together, but you should also care about your own brand, but don't, and, and this is, so this is where the additional value comes where like they're excited about content because they see it working for us. They see the fact that I get asked to be on shows like yours and things like that too. That's like something that just blows their mind, which they're really excited about. So I want to, I want to furnish that for them and get them those opportunities where they're really pumped about. Um, but also one thing I keep telling them is like, don't confuse your own brand with what is really the brand behind it. Because I never put my own brand before client boost. Cause it's all, it's all hollow. Like you can't, I can't do the service for you myself. Like who cares? Eventually like it might get bigger and bigger for my personal brand, but I care more about, and the people that I respect the most are the people who have built something, right? The ones that they can't fake anything. So I look at people like Gary Vaynerchuk, for example, you, I'm sure you're familiar with him. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of people can give him flack, but what you can't give him flack about is he has over a thousand. He's employees. an operator. Yeah how the F do you do that at that speed? Like that is impressive. So I gotta, I gotta take, I literally saw him on stage in San Diego years ago with my wife. And we were so first, we were like appalled by him. Cause he was just like raw. And, raw. <laughs> and then after that, we were done when he was done talking, we we're like, Holy shit, this guy's amazing. He has a podcast. We literally, I literally went through episode one and it was like 200 episodes, you know, so far at that point that I like listened to every single one of them went, this is crazy. Uh, bought his book, uh, went to his, uh, Hudson Yards office, was in a conference room with him as well too. get this a year ago, Bloomberg tells me our point of contact that we were up against Vayner media in the actual, like mm. the reason why we won was because we can go super deep on the technical side because we can explain and answer the reasons why. And I was like, F yeah. So anyways, the, the whole, the whole thing of like what I give them additionally in beyond money is that, is that they know that they're part of a brand vehicle that can actually exponentially make themselves more famous, you know, and open up doors too, for sure. Yeah. Stick on that topic for a second, Jonathan, who are other colleagues or mentors or people that you respect in the industry that you follow? Like a Gary V could be people, you know, or people you don't know. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, Gary V is the one that has like tangible value. Mm-hmm. tactical value that you can like listen to watch read take right away right um and, and the stuff works too so th- those are the people so i tend to say but it's not always the case because especially during the pandemic i consume a lot more content than i used to but i focus very heavily on creating more than i consume um and so i don't give my attention to a lot of people or companies that I don't find like really impressive. And he's definitely one that comes to top of mind. Um, Pep Laha from Conversion Excel, which is a conversion. Yeah. Uh, I've interviewed him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that guy's a badass. He's so funny. I, I'm literally part, I'm a teacher for their Conversion Excel Institute. And, and, and again, these guys work with like booking.com, like big brands. Right. And I, and I'm, I'm a teacher in his own course. And I say, and one of my guys on my team was like, Hey, you know, do you think we can get access to this conversion Excel? I was like, of course we can buy it. But like, let me ask Pep if I can just get it for free. So I email him. He's like, yeah, you can pay for it. I'm like, wow, <laughs> the, guy, <laughs> the guy doesn't BS the guy is straight to the point. And like all his, this is, this is, this is what really is cool about Pep that I don't think a lot of people understand his writers go on to do cool shit. So like the, he's known for his blog. So Chanel Mullen, 
um, got hired at Shopify. Uh, Alex Burkett got hired at HubSpot. <laughs> you know, like it's like it's like PayPal mob, like doing cool stuff after like the Elon Musk kind of people. So that's that's another person I have tremendous respect for. Any uh, when you were talking about the acquisition, yeah, who do you go to to get advice from? Um, it's really interesting, and it might sound super naive, but this is this is where people have given me advice. I'm like, hey, you should do better, like holding some of the information back so you can negotiate a little bit more. And I'm like, no, it it it, it doesn't really make sense for me to do that because they're going to learn it anyways at some point. And mm-hmm. so you know, I'd rather get to the answer and the end result quicker by just giving them everything now. And so I don't go to anybody really. I had a few conversations. We had like a, a business mentor who trains more of our VPs and, and, and directors. He was the one who recommended me that I actually leave entrepreneurs organization because he thought he would, it would bring me down. So I was like, okay, like I, I won't hang out with, you know, those, the, the other founders or things like that. Um, so there's not really anything I look to in regards to the acquisition that I could recommend. So, I have two last business questions. Um, and first of all, thank you, John. This has been amazing. Um, thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge. And thank you. people should check out clientboost.com with a K, K-L-I-E-N-T boost.com mm-hmm. and check out everything that you guys do. Um, and before I ask the business questions, yeah. um, I always ask since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment that you had to push through? What's been a challenging time? And then what's been a high proud moment but before those two, I want to hear from your basketball career. <laughs> what was like your favorite game of all time or something that you think back on as, because I, I just remember you telling the story of like you would just dribble in your room for like hours. I don't know. How tall oh, are you? I'm, I'm six one. So you're six one. So like yeah. you played professional basketball overseas. And um, so you must be able to dunk or do something crazy. at six one. shoot really well. Shoot That's really well. Tough. Okay. Yeah. I so, could dunk once. So maybe your, your game, like when you go to bed, hit your, your head hits a pillow and that's like the <laughs> game you think of that. So the coolest experience was, um, so I had actually gotten in a fight with my dad. I was, I was in high school over here in the U S and he sent me back home to my mom in Denmark and everywhere in the U S you can pretty like go anywhere to play a, a pickup basketball game pretty easily in Denmark. It's like, it's soccer first then it's handball. And then it's like, probably not even basketball yet at that time, but it's only like very seasonal. So you can only do it during winter or something like that. So I had a, my first job was being a receptionist in a fitness center, which I thought was like, that's going to be a very good use of me being productive, right? I can work out and I can make some money, which I actually didn't make any money. I only got, <laughs> I got a free membership from doing that. So they had like an aerobics studio and there was again, no basketball hoop, but they had this Reebok medicine ball that was rubbery and bouncy where normal medicine balls are just like, you know, you drop them and it's a large, like a loud thump and like, that's it. And so I just was dribbling like crazy and my forearm muscles were getting pretty ripped. And, and so I was getting really good at dribbling that summer. So I came back to Denmark in February that summer. Um, the, 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 the Danish championship team was holding a basketball camp. I signed up, joined, I forgot a blow up mattress. I didn't sleep on anything but my clothes scattered on like the cold cement floor. And so for a good week, I just slept on that only like my clothes, which wasn't a lot. And then go out to play like what seemed like six hours a day and then go back to sleep and all that kind of stuff. I won MVP of the, of the camp. I got asked to join the team. They gave me um, like a place to stay in the city and all that kind of stuff and comp me for travel. I physically never got, paid money. I got comped, which would still be NCAA rule breaking. So that's why I call myself professional. And it was also the professional league, but to get to your, to get, to get to your question, because they had won the Danish championship, they got invited to Euro league. And in the preseason, um, you go to like basically, uh, drive down to teams again in uh, Germany or, um, what was it, Croatia and things like that. And like, Kids in Croatia, 18 years old, average height, six, seven. It's just like farm teams down there. It's wild. Tony my, Kuk coach from the Bulls, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My favorite thing was talking to these other American players who were on these teams that we're playing against that were like bench players for USC or like massively, you know, successful college programs. And I was like, this is wild. And, I, and again, I wasn't a starter or anything like that. I came off the bench, but I got decent playing time. That was just the experience to say that you've done that was incredible. And I actually came to the U.S. 
get this, wanting to be a marine biologist and play basketball. And, wow. and the basketball thing didn't work and I hated chemistry. So I stopped marine biology and I found marketing. Were you just a lights out shooter? How did you win the MVP? Um, I guess, I guess the competition wasn't that great when I look back at it, but I was, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a decently good shooter. I can't okay. obviously, you know, be too cocky, but I'm All pretty right. good. All right. Well, Chicago dinner and then horse <laughs> is like the agenda. Um, you could probably beat me. We'll see. Um, <laughs> so low moment, challenging time and proud moment. What were um, so I, people ask me what my motivation is today. And I think I, so I've, I go to therapy, uh, pretty regularly. I, it's such a help. It's amazing. Um, with my, my wife, wife is a psychologist, by the way. Yeah. So is she, okay. Awesome. Yeah. And she'll give me a high five. Um, yeah. normalizing therapy, I think is going to happen very, very soon. It's amazing. But what we basically found out was, so my dad sent me home. Um, my mom kicked me out again, it sounds really bad. And I wasn't growing up in the hood or the ghetto or anything like that. It's all relative, right? To like your own circumstances. Then I came back over to the U S and I wasn't on terms with my dad yet, but I was with my grandma, his own mom. And she kicked me out. <laughs> and it, 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 these are reasons that are like, wow, it was like, I was like a problem kid. You seem like I, such a nice guy. Was everyone I, so let me, let me give you the reason. So yeah. my dad, um, I, was, I got a girlfriend in high school. I started losing focus on basketball. I started losing focus on um, school and like my grades were dropping and all that kind of stuff. And we got in a fight and I was like, dad, why don't you just send me home? And he was like, cool. He printed out a British Airways itinerary that day, got me to the airport and like sent me off. My mom had, cause I lived so many years in the U S had basically, um, you know, continued her own life, got a boyfriend at the time, moved in together. They moved to another part of Denmark, which is called Jutland, which is like, the South, you know, in the U S equivalent. And I just didn't get along with the boyfriend. Um, it was more him being threatened by me. I was actually pretty chill, but I was 18 at the time. And my mom was like, can you get, you know, your own place? And I was like, sure. I did. I got stress induced asthma, like literally couldn't reach an apex of my breath, like the, the peak of it. And that's like the most frustrating. Imagine taking a deep breath and not being able to like, I've experienced it, it like a couple of, it's so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. So that happened. Um, how to, how to get my first job and all that kind of stuff too, which sounds easy, but it's not easy when both your parents are not there to really support you. And then my grandma kicked me out because I didn't uh, change the light bulb in my own bathroom fast enough. And I had a dent, a tiny little dent in the bumper that I didn't get fixed fast enough either. She just decided to send me out. So my point is, is that I had people who have control in my life to pull the rug out from underneath me that since then, this is now, so that's my down part. My highlight is that since then I've been so focused on making my rug as heavy as possible financially that I have this drive that I have today because I had this fear in the back of my mind that somebody can just yank it out. Um, so I took my bad things and turned them into good things, which I'm really thankful for. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. It's a lot of times I find that hard charging really motivated people. There's some pain that's driving them. Or fear you know, that they don't want to realize. Fear, fear and pain. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, thank you again, Jonathan. People check out clientboost.com and, um, you know, everything that you're doing. I really appreciate uh, your time and knowledge. Thank you, my man. Yeah. It was so fun being on here. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. Feeling like a hundred grand